Treatment decisions. <coughs> this is where you need your veterinarian. They know the drugs. Residue avoidance at all costs. Nothing you can do that will ever get you out of trouble by putting antibiotic residues in milk. How well has China done with the melamine problem? Their dairy industry still hasn't recovered. What's that, two years ago? Three years ago? Or longer? <coughs> so again, we can't afford things like that. Your herd veterinarian understands the drug treatments and the intervals needed. Remember, not all clinical cases need drugs. Typical dairy, cow gets tongue mastitis, you use the same treatment on every cow. What do I do on your dairy if a third of those cows you didn't have to give antibiotics to? I only know one person that would be upset. The pharmaceutical company. And think about this. Your worst day is their best day. Is that who you want what, looking out for you? Don't think so. One treatment does not fit all types of mastitis. Correct treatment yields higher cure rates and less dump milk over the lactation. Repeat cases do not need to be treated over and over again. I was at a dairy the other day that treated a cow 16 times in one lactation with the same treatment. I said, and you really think if it didn't work after three or four, it's going to work after 15, 16? Some cows, you just have to decide they're not going to cure. And what you do when they have bad milk, you put them in the bucket, feed it to the calves, give them oxytocin. When the milk goes normal, you put them back in the line. At least you're only out the milk. And you're not out the cost of the drug and the time you got to withhold the milk regardless. So again, think about what we're doing. So sorry, how do we know which cows need the drug? Then? That's the problem here. If you don't have the tools you need, so a lot of people, if you work with your veterinarian, there's some things I'm going to show here in a second that I think will help. And what we do in more and more dairies, because of the distance you have here in Australia, more and more vet clinics, more and more farms are doing on-farm culture. Very simple. You start with simply, are they gram positive or gram negative? All gram positive need antibiotics. Mild and moderate gram negatives don't need. There's no research in the world that says it's beneficial to treat them. So again, there's a 70% cure rate without antibiotics, a 65% cure rate with antibiotics on gram negative. So why would we want to do anything but take them out, feed the calves, and when they go back normal, put them back in the line. So what we do is we know that therapy is based on what bug caused it. So it's really simple. Do we have the right drug for the right <coughs> bug? We need results in 24 hours. I did, when I was president of the National Mastitis Council, we did a symposium. There's no literature anywhere in the world that shows a 24-hour delay. Now, remember, I'm not talking about a hot, toxic cow, but on chunks and clots and stuff, 24-hour delay has no impact on cure rate. So we pull the cow, we give her oxytocin, we get a culture result back, and that will tell us which treatment to use. So we use a plate that tells us, we use a different plate you can't get here that gives us more than just grandfather gram negative, but at Moxie, they're using the biplate, which is simply a gram positive, gram negative. <coughs> the incubators are very inexpensive, so if they're $30 in the US, they'll be 90 here. <laughs> you know what the best value in Australia is? Golf. <laughs> I can't believe how cheap your golf is here. And I'm like, everything else is twice to three times. Well, in the US, I had a hard time when I bought my first diet coat. I thought I bought the whole six pack. <laughs> But they only gave me one. I'm like, holy <laughs> mackerel. Just to make sure, because uh, they got a little bit of pain, pain replacement, we'll make sure we get all that bad milk out. And oxytocin is a good therapy on abnormal milk count. Because a lot of cows, you know, they're sore. Their udders are a little swollen. And, you know, what happens on almost every cow? She was given 15 liters yesterday. She got mass size she gave seven. What happened to the other eight liters? Probably in her udder, but she just hurts saying ain't going to give it to you. So oxytocin is a good therapy to help clean out udders. You don't want to use it all the time. You want to use it for a very limited time. But your veterinarians can help you direct that. <coughs> so it's simple. We take a sterile swab, we put the milk on, and now we know it's a grandfather or gram negative. So now we can have your veterinarian set up treatment protocols. If it's grandfather, here's the best first choice based on their experience. I'm sure 
Doc knows here what's best in your area, what seems to work on most of your farm. It might be different than what works in Victoria. But having the best first choice will reduce the chance of the repeat mastitis. Remember, the culture results are only good as a sample you take. You gotta take a good sample so the veterinarian can teach you how to take a good proper sample. So when we get that, we know the bacteria that's causing mastitis. We can track, select the right treatment and dosage and more important, the right duration. Every bacteria needs a different length of time. And what does every mastitis do here in Australia? Say? Treat for three milkings, treat for three days. How many people have ever had a child with an ear infection? Okay, so when you go to a doctor, they ever give you just treatments for three days? <coughs> no, they give you treatments for seven to 10 days so they make sure they cure the bug. And what happens when we treat cows those first couple days we knock out about 70 to 75 percent of the organism we quit treating and what do we leave behind 20 to 25 percent of the organism that says now i'm going to be resistant besides and now all of a sudden what happens five to ten days later she blows up again now this time the treatment doesn't work if we would have treated her right the first time we probably would have cured her there are studies even done by zoetis on one of their tubes they claim uh Two treatments, 24 hours apart. In the World Bioetrics, the research by Dr. Oliver showed if you do that, you'll have a 37% cure rate. If you take that same cow and would have treated her five milkings, you would have a 94% cure rate. So again, the industry says how, the, all the farmer wants is how short can I treat her, how much <coughs> can I get her back pain. And what happens, we get so much repeat mastitis that doesn't respond, then we get chronic cows, and then we end up selling. So if we do it right the first time, we'll make your life a lot easier. Again, remember what I said first, you do not want to contaminate your milk supply. Yeah. But we don't have a dairyman in the United States that doesn't make every cow that they treat gets tested before she goes to And there's simple tests you can use here in Australia that will do that for you. So whenever you go off label, that's why you need your veterinarian. To help you understand the consequences if we're going to do this what do we need to do to protect ourselves but it doesn't make any sense to do it by label and end up retreating the cow three or four times so we're trying to get you to the point where right drug with the right bug gets better cures and less repeat strep species strep hubris everybody says it never existed here but it's been here all along you just didn't look for it the bottom line is this is the bug that most likely will go chronic on you if undertreated. The war cardinal rule I never want you to forget about strep species, strep species equals species. It comes from manure. So if you got manure on the units, manure on your hands, they're in manure, strep species equals species. Most likely go chronic if not properly treated. It's a gram positive. Manure is the source, maybe number one in Australia. Coliform is a gram-negative bacteria, very common here, needs immediate response, especially if it's severe. Source is manure, water, environment. Mild and moderate, you don't need antibiotics. Severe, you need to do, throw the book at them. But again, you, your veterinarian can help you with those protocols. Gram-negative severe, you know they need more than a mastitis tube, they need fluids, they need systemic antibiotics, you know, you need to treat them so they don't die. So we gotta make sure we treat them properly. No growths, 90% of them are gram negative. So if they don't grow anything, we put them in the gram negative category. We give them oxytocin, put them in the tank as quickly as we can. Wide culture, better treatment choice. And it changes when it's hot here, coliforms are probably your biggest enemy. When it's wet here, streps are probably your biggest enemy. So it changes by season. If you don't know what the bug is, we're only guessing. There is no tube in the world that takes care of all mastite. So let's start selecting our treatments, the right drug for the right bug. Have your veterinarian set up protocols for it. If it's gram positive and mild, you might want to use special formula or, or uh, one of the cloxacillin ones. If it's gram positive and severe, you might want to use special formula. But again, if it's a gram-negative mild, you probably only want to use supportive therapy. If it's gram-negative severe, you probably want to use, was it Masticon, is it called, or Mast something like that. 
because that's got a high efficacy towards gram negative. So again, what I tell people here, why did you not use that until your second treatment choice? So now you can just throw the milk that much longer. If we'd have used that first, it should have been tank a lot faster, and we probably would have cured the cow. Quality milk programs, dry cow therapy, it's a key to lower cell count for the next lactation. Protocols we know uh, help cure existing infections. This is where the next lactation is enhanced the room. Time to take a look at this and messy. <coughs> Uh, is your veterinarian in front? You know, we know environmental mastitis most occurs uh, right around calving time. But what most people don't realize, 65% of all clinicals that occur in the first 100 days of lactation because they were infected at calving. Think about that one. When do they show up? Right when that cow is given the most milk. And it really irritates you. So again, Look at what's happening on your dairy. We know if cows go infected and dry off, but we don't, and uh, they're not infected, we cured them during the right period, we still lost 11% of our lifetime future production. If a cow goes infect, uh, dry infected, we didn't cure, she's gonna lose a third of her future production. And what's even worse is they go dry, clean, and calve infected. Almost 37% of her future production will be affected. So the dry cow period is very important. Overcrowding, if our dry cow facilities are overcrowded, we increase the pathogen load on the teats. We decrease the cow's ability to fight the disease. Total dry cow antibiotic therapy, internal sealants is the way. That's what everybody does. Most effective treatment, best for chronic cows, helps uh, heal damaged tissue. We want to prevent new infection, eliminate existing infections, strategic timing, we don't have to throw milk away, we minimize, minimize the surge of new cases after calving. Current recommendation, every cow immediately after the last milk, do it as clean as you can. And in my opinion, if you don't have somebody do it, the best person dry treating, don't do it. Future recommendations, selective dry cow therapy with blanket teat seal. The world is coming at us when we have a huge target on our back. There are now 15 countries that will have banned dry cow therapy on clean cows. It is going to be forced down our throat. So we need to think about that. It's an excellent, you need excellent management and records to achieve this. So what are the rules if they're going to use no antibiotic therapy. She can never have a cell count above 200,000 in her whole lactation. She can never have a case of clinical in her whole lactation. I've had a few dairies here come and say, well, we're now trying to save money, so we're using teat sealants on our, we're dry cow treating everybody, we're using sealant on our high cell count cows and no sealant on our low cell count cows. I said, I can't think that's got to be the worst decision you can make. Wouldn't you rather keep your clean cows clean? The high cell count ones are already, you've lost the mark on them. We're going to have to start thinking about this, and I think it's going to become the world rule probably in the next five to ten years. So if you have the ability to move in that direction, you think you can handle it, you might want to think about this. So with the cows that have gone negative and the cows have gone positive, yep. treat them differently with the cow therapy, that's yep. not. So but what? dry cow therapy, we don't have that kind of a selection in dry tube that basically only have gram positive coverage anyway. So many countries are doing it, public pressure will force us there. We need to manage that change when it comes. So we milk the cow out completely. We post stiffer and marker. We then scrub the teeth with alcohol gauze starting with the far first, the near second. What we like is four by four uh, gauze we do not ever use a little alcohol pad that comes with the tube. And we use uh, a 60 or 70% alcohol. So you can actually clean the teeth. Or we use alcohol towels. Because if we don't get that teeth clean, the worst thing to do, whether we use the sealant alone or dry tube in the sealant, put bugs in them. So we gotta be careful. Then we put our tubes in, start close, go far, Anybody know why we do close and far and far and close? 
So you go through all the trouble to clean these close teats, and when you reach across to do the far teats, you got your dirty arm running on the teat you just cleaned. So you always want to think about how do I decrease risk. Partial insertion is much safer than full insertion. And then what we do on every cow is we post dip after we treat. Another thing we got to think about is make sure we never put the syringes in a bucket of water. Some people throw in a bucket of warm water because it makes it easier to put them in. Great way to cause pseudomonas or protothecum mastitis in your dairy. <coughs> you don't want to do that. Never want to take the cap off until you're ready to put the tube in the cow's teeth. I've seen people take caps off and lay them on the dirty floor. Don't make sense. The other thing we got to think about times of change. When I was a kid and we milked cows, we used to hope a cow could make it to the end of her lactation when she needed to be dried up. Now I hear farmers brag how much milk their cows give on the day of dry up. The more cow milk the cows give on the day of dry up, the higher the risk she's going to have an infection when she carries. So one of the things we're doing now, and the research is really good on this, if they're over 22 liters, we move them to a pre-dry off pen two week, one to two weeks prior to calving. And we feed them straw and minerals to make sure they drop on milk, and then we dry treat them. And that has reduced new infections dramatically. We used to do it all the time years ago. We always used to force the cow to drop on milk. And now we just, and you watch these cows giving over 25 liters of milk. They're out there after you dry treat them. You see milk running out of their teats. And guess what's going right along with it? The sealant and the antibiotics. The other option we have is we'll have our dairymen will do this. They will dry treat the cow send her out to the uh, dry cow pin. One week later, they'll bring her in, hand milk her out, and then dry treat her and seal her. So there's a couple things you can do if you're really dealing with some high production cows. 